morning, everyone, uh, and welcome back uh, to the spotlight on driving services. In case uh, you don't know, this is actually a monthly series where uh, my co-host Julianne Wolf and I shine spotlights every month on a new service organization so that you can learn a little bit about them and what they have to offer. But before uh, we dive in in today's session, um, just wanted to ask if anybody had a chance to catch up um, last month's episode uh, on the spotlight uh, with Joe from the PMO squad. If not, we really, really encourage you to go to the website and, and check it out. So with that being said, um, I would like to tell you uh, what you can expect uh, from today's session. Uh, we'll, we'll just start up with a short overview of uh, today's guests and or, uh, its, its organization. Uh, then from there, we can dive in into some questions about leadership, uh, challenges, problem solving, collaboration, and why not sustainability. Um, we have chosen a set of interesting questions, which we believe will keep us all entertained until the end. And I'm sure Jim will, will give us all his experience on those questions. Um, if any questions from the audience, uh, we will have a uh, follow-up uh, quick wrap uh, question answer uh, at the end of the session. So any questions, please hold them to the end and type them in the chat box. Um, and then um, I will just give you an insight of um, the next month's um, spots on, on driving services. So uh, for now, I would tell everybody to grab a cup of coffee or your preferred beverage, relax and enjoy this hour uh, where we want to shine the spotlight onto JP Stewart Consulting. Um, he, uh, it's a US-based project management firm that specializes in agile waterfall project management and um, PMO solutions, obviously. Uh, they are an excellent strategic partner for everyone that will uh, want to succeed, and they will help you bridge uh, your organization and demystify any complex subjects um, and set you all up for success. Uh, this being said, today we uh, are representing uh, JP Stewart Consulting uh, by its founder and president, Jim Stewart. Um, he comes uh, with a very large experience in project management uh, with over 25 years, um, as well as he serves on the advisory board of the of a training organization called Mind Edge Incorporated, as well as he's the co-author of a book facilitating project planning meetings, a practical guide to ensuring project success. So welcome, Jim. We are so happy to have you here today. Um, so I would open uh, and let you uh, take us on a ride uh, into J.P. Stewart Consulting. Who is J.P. Stewart Consulting? Well, first of all, thank you, Gabrielle and Joe, for, for inviting me. It's great to be invited someplace. So I have some history with Joe because um, the book you mentioned about the meetings, uh, I forget how it came to be. Maybe maybe my partner, Rich, Rich Maltzman, knew Joe, but Joe interviewed us a while back uh, about that book. So, uh, and that particular thing is about communications and running big meetings. We're not here to talk about that, but I just want to say that I have some history with that. For me, how this all came to be is, for those of you who don't know, I'm in the Boston area, just north of Boston. And um, I'd had a pretty good career as a project manager. For an, I actually started as a network engineer. So my background is in IT, high tech. 
I did that for a number of years, and I can either continue in that vein and probably run an IT shop or go into project management. It was a, sort of a natural diversion. And quite frankly, in 2001, in the midst of the um, dot-com implosion, I got laid off and uh, not expecting that. And then 9-11 happened, and there were not a lot of jobs happening for quite some time. So after a while, I said to myself or to my wife as well, I said, why don't I try to do something independently because I wanted to anyway. I'd been independent before contract work. And so I thought, how can I get started? And one day, a university sent me a card in the mail and it said, would you like to get class on project management? I called them up. I said, how about if I teach it? So I did. So a little bit of initiative in doing that. From there, I just started doing, because I've been doing training before in computers. From there, I just started to build my business. I started uh, training. And I got very lucky. Uh, I, I found a Project Management Institute job on their job board. You know, it's just miraculously, this is 2003. And there was a woman running a company and she was all life sciences, pharmaceutical, hospitals, medical, all these things. And she said, and I didn't have that background. She said, yeah, but I need somebody like you to help me go into these companies and start projects. So we went all over the world with that um, for years with her, she's a Finnish woman. And uh, she still has the company, but she's since moved to California. So I did all those, all those projects. And that was part of what led to that book. Those planning sessions are some that Rich had done as part of telecom. So to make a long story short, from there, I just started building on my skill set. Um, obviously, you know how to do traditional uh, waterfall projects. Interestingly, I, I got my PMP in 2001, the very same year the Agile Manifesto was created, but I'd never heard of it. Most of us hadn't. So at the same time as I was building my career on the waterfalls, traditional waterfall side, Agile was happening. I was reading about it, but not quite dipping into it. So I just went up. I see myself as a generalist. Um, I run projects in waterfall. I've been doing Agile now since 2013, so I can do either side. I can work in a hybrid. I don't turn things down. I don't accept things if I don't think I can do them. If somebody comes and says, can you do X, Y, Z project? I'll say, I haven't done one before. And they might say, we'll take a chance on you. They might say, okay, that's fine. So uh, running projects, uh, writing articles, teaching, I've taught at the university level, written that book, um, uh, pharmaceutical work, financial work, IT work, a couple of stints at Fidelity. Things like that. And then one day, to get to our topic about PMOs, I just wanted to do a PMO. It sounded interesting. And a colleague of mine, well, actually, I'll go back a step. I had approached him because he was teaching at Brandeis University. And once again, I said, can I teach with you? So he and I co-wrote a course on program management. I wound up taking over a course of a colleague who's still there. She's been there for 24 years, taking over her course as she moved on. And I went, and he was doing PMOs. And I said, can I learn PMOs? He said, sure. The open guy. And, and we met and talked about it. And, and he, you know, gave me some templates he'd used confidentially and ideas he'd done. And I wound up doing my first PMO. I got hired to do uh, other kinds of work, but I got hired at one company to do a PMO. This is about five years ago. And I set that up. And since then, I've done, I think, four or five. I don't do them constantly. I go from PMO to running projects to not doing, you know, to doing other things. So um, that's sort of the very quick nutshell of, of what I've done and do. I'm really a one-man shop, and I used to call myself JP Stewart Associates, and I still have that out there because I can team up with people who are colleagues of mine and make myself a bigger organization. So, for example, if I do an Agile transformation one day, uh, then I might call on a partner of mine, a friend of mine who's a change management expert, or she sometimes calls me to do things. I have other colleagues slash friends who I called and put together kind of a tiger team and do that for a while. So it's really all things project management. And just uh, this year, uh, my most recent two projects were, um, well, three, setting up a PMO uh, down in DC, which I can talk about a little bit later for you if you'd like it. That was, all the PMOs are different. All different, they're all challenging. I just came off of two projects. One was um, a, a, a entrepreneurial woman who wanted a, a Apple-based application. So I played Scrum Master sort of project manager coach for that because I'm a manager coach as well. And the one I just finished was for a large financial firm. Can't tell you their name, but they were rolling out Salesforce, which allows them to you know, obviously sell. 
It was very complicated, a lot more complicated than you would think. And I was playing sort of a sub project manager. When I came in, there was a program manager already, and I came in and I played sort of helping them with deliverables, like an escalation tree for support, uh, helping with SOX compliance, things like that. And so I just finished that one up now, and I'm looking at one tomorrow that will bring me into another. But the cool thing about being independent, it's always something new. Now I have an organization, a consulting firm wants for me to come in, and they do data science. They do data analytics, big data, which I worked on before. So they may want me to manage projects working with data scientists. So it's always something new and something cool. So I hope that gives you a flavor of it, of what I do and what I've been doing for the past, well, 25 years, but 18 independent. Yes, wonderful. What a journey. You know, a lot of times bad things happen, but always something good comes out of it. Um, and my dad used to say that the most beautiful roses bloom from underneath the rocks. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And, you know, it, it can be an uphill battle. It's not all, it's not all sweetness and light. Sometimes you want it for situations that are aren't good before you get into them. And, and so some training situations, some consulting situations where the car just stacked against you before you even walk in the door because one person wants what you wanted, but the rest, everybody else in the department doesn't want it. So as the song says, know when to hold them, when to fold them. Sometimes I say, you know what? Maybe this isn't working out. <laughs> I'll move on. So I can find something I really like and stick with it. And if not, I just say they don't seem to be open to the particular thing I'm offering and move on. You, you can't stick around if it's not something. If, if a company tells you they're committed to change and that's a verbal thing that they say, but their actions don't follow, there's no point in being there. I've seen too many companies like that. Yes, we want to change. As soon as you recommend anything, it's always no. And I, I don't mind a challenge, but I don't feel like particularly being on a death march if you follow me. So. But most of them are, are, are pretty good. Most of them work out pretty well. The people are open to what you want to do within an hour window of what they want to do. Yes, yes, definitely. And, and I, I agree. I went through similar challenges where, you know, a company is saying, yes, we want to change, uh, but it was all words. Um, yeah. It actually came to, you know, seeing the change and, and trying to implement some of the good things uh, that could come out of that, uh, there was always resistance. And, you know, change is not easy for anyone. But, uh, you know, if we don't embrace change, our life is on a continuous change and roller coaster all the time. We're not right. in the same spot uh, every minute. So, very, very uh, good journey. And it looks like you have a lot of experience gained um, from this um, journey that you were on um, as a private and, and still, and I'll say one more thing. I bet, I think I will put words in Joe's mouth whenever he comes back on, but I have experiences when you go into a company and you want to do something like a PMO and you tell them it will take two, three, four months, whatever. And the part of, that, part of that is because they can't meet with you every day. They can meet with you sporadically to do things. And invariably, I find at the end of that time, they're just tired of it. They don't say that, but they stop showing up for meetings or it becomes, oh, do I have to do this again or whatever? So there's a, I have to get into a certain window and do it before they lose interest in the very thing they hired before. They're willing to change, but they find that, you know, we, we uh, we don't have time for this anymore. Just the last company I did, the PMO, they, in the beginning, said, we want training. I was going to create templates, create processes. We want training. And so after we established the PMO, I started to meet with uh, the, the, one of the owners. This is shortly after we had established everything and ready to do training. And then they were starting to slack me saying, we can't move this fast. I'm thinking, this was your idea. <laughs> I mean, we agreed in the contract that we would do training around this time. Now you're saying we can't move. I don't know what this fast means. They weren't upset with me. It was just sort of like, they just maybe thought they could, were ready to do the training before they really were. They had proposals to answer. So I think people are euphoric when they hire you about what you can get done. Like the longer it goes on, I don't think four months is a long time at all to do what we were doing. And it wasn't by any means every day, but they want to move on. They get impatient and want to move on to other things. 
So, so I, there's, you had asked, I think when we were talking or emailing, a challenge we will bring up a PMO, staying, staying with it. I mean, I think the person establishing it stays with it because that's his or her job. But the people for whom you're doing it, boy, it's hard to keep their interest. It's hard to keep them engaged because they feel like this is some part-time thing for them. That's a big challenge of, of establishing PMOs, if you ask me, is, is keeping people engaged. I can't force them to be engaged. And there was one point at the end of that engagement where I couldn't get anybody's attention. So uh, yeah, just four people, and they were all too busy. And it wasn't because they didn't like what I was doing. They were just too busy. So nature of the beast. Occupational yeah. hazard. I call it an <laughs> occupational hazard. That's all. That's right. It, it's their loss, right? Uh, we all know the importance and, and how you coordinate your business. Uh, having a BMO and uh, the advantages of it, yes, it comes with a ticket, but yeah. um, obviously it's, it's a good thing. But anyways, thank you so much for this, um, this uh, introduction uh, and this dive into um, what your company does and what you can do for uh, any of the clients. And I do encourage everyone to go out there and buy this book um, and read it. And I'm sure we're going to find a lot of good other ideas and insights to it. So, uh, Jim, as uh, you presented this, I would like to challenge you with a couple of questions. <laughs> um, hopefully, you find them. Um, good and you can shed a little bit of light on which superhero or role model would you call on to face the biggest challenge for PMOs today and why is that? It's funny I can't think of a role model because I don't have one in this business quite honestly I mean there are people like Harold Kirsten that have written books and uh, Rita Mulcahy and Joe for what he does, you know, winning awards all over the place for PMO stuff. Those are good role models. But as far as a superhero, for me, if I were a superhero doing this, I'm playing every superpowers, I, I would like the superhero that doesn't have superpowers. And I think of Iron Man. And I think of Iron Man because he only has superpowers when he puts on this metal cage that he's in. Otherwise, he's kind of a normal guy. But when he puts this thing on, he can battle every, every kind of challenge that comes along. He's got armor. And he can deflect the bullets or whatever you want to call it. He's got strength. So the type of super, super power you need, because there's it, it, two parts to your question. What superhero? What's the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge for PMOs, I think, today is to justify their existence, because they tend to be cost centers, not profit centers, to face the negative reaction of some people in the organization thinking, why do we need it? Several challenges. And also the incorporation of Agile. Where does Agile fit in? Because PMOs are seen as being somewhat process heavy, whether that's true or not. And whereas Agile is lightweight. So in order to combat those challenges and then keep the, then keep the PMO going, to combat those, my superhero power would be Iron Man, would be that superhero. Ordinary guy walks in, you know, puts on his armor and has all kinds of quote unquote superpowers, can fight uh, the negative stakeholders, if you will, and 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 knock away the, the, the bullets that approach them. There's a lot of bullets that come your way when you're when you put yourself in a position or can be, unless you have strong sponsor support. And I think for any project of all any sort, uh, especially a PMO, you need a strong sponsor. Without one, you need you know, a lot of you need to be both. Iron Man or Superman at that point, but I'll settle for Iron Man if I have a good sponsor. All right. Yes, very interesting. The right tools at the right time for the right application. Right. Correct. That's interesting. Yes, for sure. Okay. So uh, our next question here is, what's your problem solving tagline? This is interesting because I let me answer that in two ways, the sort of boring businessy way and the more fun way. Now, there is a thing called a value proposition you're probably familiar with. And the value proposition says in one line, what value does my company provide? Now, I've worked on this before with some friends of mine who 
we went through consulting groups and talked about it. I had a long wordy one, but I did some research and a value proposition. I came up with one line. Before I get to that businessy one, my problem solving one, and I, I test drove this one at the consulting group I was in, was my problem solving tagline is I'm the, I'm the project doctor. So as the project doctor, I come in and fix whatever ails you, right? So if it's a PMO that's dysfunctional, I can fix that. If it's a project that's in trouble, I can help recover that. So my problem solving tagline is I'm the project doctor and I can fix what ails you. So that's the fun one. The sort of businessy one is this. This is my value proposition. I'm gonna read it because I only just wrote it. I dramatically improve project management capabilities, enabling strategic objectives to be met and exceeded more rapidly. So that isn't necessarily problem solving per se, but that encapsulates what it is I think I do. There's a strategy level to it. We project managers, as you know, can no, no longer just be project managers. We're expected to be strategic. I teach PMP and PMI talks a lot about it and has for years. Increasingly, I've, I've taught PMP since I've been independent, since 2003. Uh, and back then it was more about the project manager managing projects as now it's more about him or her being strategic and solving strategic problems, which I do, you do, I'm sure, I know Joe does, and probably your listeners as well, or at least we are involved in the strategy of the company. So two levels in that one, the project doctor, the fun one, people relate to it and say, I know what that means. And the other one that talks about working strategically to enable uh, companies to meet their objectives. Second one is less problem solving, but it's more of a value proposition. All right, interesting. So. We need your expertise in solving COVID problem too. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because I, of course I know nothing about solving something like that, but I am, I, the, the project I worked on uh, for, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't COVID, but the PMO I helped on in DC was for uh, what they call social determinants of health. It's a public project. And it's about why does somebody in an affluent neighborhood have better health than somebody in, a, in an urban neighborhood? I think we know why, but they study things like that. So I'm interested in those type of things. When I've worked on health problems or projects, I worked on diabetes projects, medical device projects. You know, they're doing good work, those people, people that do this type of work. Nobody has asked me to manage, uh, although what I would like to see in COVID-19, quite honestly, lessons learned. I hope that somebody somewhere, whether it's Fauci or somebody else, is heading up a lessons learned a session or sessions so that we know how to survive it better this time. Because I think worldwide, not to single any one place, worldwide we didn't really tackle as effectively as we might have. I think we were prepared, as prepared for the thing that many of us knew would eventually happen again. So I think it's, it will probably happen again. Hopefully it's not 100 years from now, but. I would, I would think that we would have a better United solution to it. I think project managers can help in that respect. We're not, we don't walk on water, but we can sure pull together people in a collective way and get them to do things. Yes, I, I do agree. Yeah, so some, some instances, putting up my project management hat as well, you know, how, how was everything rolled out and, uh, I would like to see those lessons learned as well. And I'm sure a lot of people would want to want to see put, them. And put them in place. Number one problem people have in projects, and I see this over and over again, they do a lessons learned session. And I have people admit this to my face who are like my students. I forget who told me this recently. Yeah, we do lessons learned sessions, but nothing ever happens. We'll say, well, shouldn't you make it happen? Or they'll say, we do retrospectives and nothing ever happens. You can't take one idea and make it happen. So I, I recommend to people listening, and I do it myself. If you're gonna do lessons learned, then implement the lessons you've learned. If you don't, I don't know what the point is, other than a checkbox saying you did a lessons learned. It doesn't make any sense. That's, that's right, yeah. And, and there might be companies out there that just do exactly that. They just file them away, part of a paperwork and uh, don't go back to those. So yeah, big mistake. We all yeah. need to learn from our lessons. Correct. All right, so I would like to dive into our next questions. Um, if you are making a movie on what it takes to lead, describe the plot. This is interesting. I'm gonna take a book I read and then 
uh, sort of turn into my own book movie. So I have a Kindle reader. I read, still read books, you know, paperback or hardback. But I like my Kindle sometimes because you can travel and have a hundred books on there. So one day uh, they gave me a free book. It's called Lost in Shangri-La. Lost in Shangri-La is a true story. I forget the island that it was on, but during World War II, um, whether the Philippines or Borneo, I can't remember now, uh, there was people stationed there, you know, army, navy, whatever. And they used to take, on the down days, they would take a plane, the pilots would take a plane and take people on joyrides. And they would go on a joyride in the jungle. And then one day, one of the planes went down and it went missing for a long time. Nobody knew where it was. They knew they had taken it, but they couldn't find it because it went down to a wooded, covered jungle and there were natives living there. So these people were there for, I forget how long, months living there until they finally got everybody out. But I started thinking, a few people died in the crash. But um, it was really a heck of a story lost in Shangri-La. And, uh, and it talks about what it took to survive in that environment. I thought, well, what if you turn that into a movie? Maybe there is one. Maybe I missed it. What if you turn that into a movie and said, you know, you had a person there who was um, shy and withdrawn and not a leader. And you had the leader in this situation and he or she, probably he back then in the 40s, got sick and had to be carried around on a, um, uh, on some kind of a hammock or something. And my movie would be about the secondary person who's shy, that doesn't show leadership, taking over and becoming a leader. And so where to take the lead? So let's say it's a she in this case, and she's, everybody says, we don't know what to do. And so she sits there and says, well, somebody's got to decide what we need to do. So she says, follow me. <laughs> I'm not sure where we're going, but follow me. And, and, and they do. And maybe she takes them down a few blind alleys, but then she figures out where to go. So, so my movie, just make it interesting, because movies are dull if there isn't a, a, a challenge, right? Uh, I, I've written before, and you, you, know, you throw rocks at your protagonist. And the rock that gets thrown at the protagonist here is the main guy is sick and he can't lead. There's a woman, she's going to step up and lead. She gets a lot of challenges along the way. The men, you know, fight her. The natives fight her. The bugs bite her, whatever it might be. But she steps up and says, I think, I think the first thing that happens and what it takes to lead is stepping up. And you step up and you get over whatever it is that holds you back from leading. So in this case, she steps up try something, not everything works. But then when people challenge her, she says, yeah, well, I stepped up and leave from there. So I just thought that would be an interesting plot that shows, yeah, I could make one, a movie that would just show this guy leading and he always does, so what? But an interesting movie is the leader, you know, uh, get shot down somewhere, somebody else steps up to lead, goes through all the challenges and at the end, everybody respects her. I remember that, um, reminded me of that movie, Hidden Figures, I think it's called, where are these women, I think these black women who were at NASA, who were very important in helping uh, in rocket, uh, rocketry in, in years past. And, and, the, and the woman is not, you know, she, she's disrespected by the men. They don't want to talk to her. This is, you know, 60s, whatever it is. And by the end of the movie, I forget it's the time, Hank, somebody walks by and after she's done all this great stuff, puts a cup of coffee on her desk and walks away. Like, it's almost this quiet show of respect for what she did. So by the end of my movie, we had the Hollywood string swelling, everybody's happy. And whether there's a cup of coffee or everybody's hugging each other, at least we found that the person looks at them and says, yeah, you really can't leave in one way. Either shows it or does it. That's a, that's a movie I would maybe enjoy. It's corny. It's cliche probably. It's Maybe it's old fashioned. But maybe I'm old fashioned. I like a movie like that. So people who, what it takes to lead are people who are willing to step up and then actually do it, walk the talk, if you will. Yes, very nice, very interesting. Um, and and I, I could say that, you know, a lot of people, you know, working on projects, working in PMOs, uh, you see those type of shy people. And right. they're, they're not necessarily wanting to come out. And Correct. Once in a while, you know, you see this bright light coming from, you know, these type of people and actually with, with great ideas. Uh, yeah, they need to be drawn out a little bit. When I was first, before I taught anything, I was working. Don't be impressed. I was working at Harvard University, but I was a clerk, very much a clerk early in my career, and uh, at the law school, as a matter of fact. And <laughs> I uh, I had a great boss, 
I, I accidentally passworded their computer system playing with it. And anybody else would have fired me. She says, you seem interested. Why don't you go to school for it? Uh, okay. So I went to school for it. She paid for it. And I learned how to do that. Then she caught me talking to one of the lawyers explaining something. She says, you have a knack for explaining things. Why don't you teach? So I said, okay. So it's kind of interesting that sometimes people pull you out and see something you, you don't see in yourself. And that teaching both those things, uh, you know, I got into computers. had a heck of a career there. The career led to uh, teaching. And it led to my being able to segue into IT project management, which I've been doing. So I wouldn't say she's entirely responsible for my career, but boy, she helped a lot. And she saw things in me. I didn't think I spent the rest of my life as a clerk, but I, I didn't, wasn't quite sure what to do. And so she sort of pushed me in the right direction. So that's sometimes the leader, maybe my a plot twist in my movie says, you know, you can do it, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, somebody's there playing the harmonica and saying, you know, you can do it. So uh Anyway, I think there may be that too, what you have inside yourself and every once in a while, someone to make you realize what they see in you that you don't see in yourself. Yeah, that, that's that's really critical and important that the right person sees your right, your right strength, right. Uh, that they can pull you into the right direction. But you don't even see, you have a blind spot and don't see it at all yourself. I never would have thought I would teach. I was an introvert and shy. I've spent more time standing in front of people in the last 30 years than I could public speaking, teaching, don't bother me at all. I'm partially thanks to her throwing me out there and saying, just get up there and do it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. right. Okay. So I would move forward into okay. our next one. So I know you co co authored a book. But if you would have to write a new book on promoting and sustaining collaboration, what would be the title? You know, this will sound kind of boring, but it's to the point. I say something like working together, a recipe for success, because it's right to the point. It is a long title. It just gets to the point of, of working together. And, and it, you know, because I do believe, especially since I've been involved in Agile, which is all about collaboration. So working together is a recipe for success. The, the cliche is there's no I in team. I'm pretty much of a soul, I'm a sole practitioner, but I never, almost never not work in a team. I write questions as well. I do courseware. That's kind of a sole thing, but sometimes I have to collaborate. My friend Rich and I, again, we got to know each other because um, we started writing questions together for that woman. And we would collaborate. I send him a question, he sent me a question, et cetera. So working together, uh, a recipe for success is maybe I will, because the not working together, you know, not collaborating if you're in a team, it's the opposite, I think. And so now would that promote and sustain it? Oh, yeah, maybe. I mean, I would spend most of the book explaining why, what I mean by working together, why is recipes for success and promoting it and sustaining it, keep it going. I, I think it's, I think collaboration is self-sustaining. I think that if you have wins, and I've seen this in Agile especially, if people start working together and they go through the various stages of norming, forming, storming, and performing, if they go through those various stages and they start to see results, because we're all very results driven, we're all instant gratification. <laughs> I never thought about that before. Brain flash. There's a certain amount of instant gratification in Agile you don't get with a waterfall. At the end of a sprint, you're done with something, some increment. And during the sprint, you can see moving things across the task board from to do, doing, and done. So there's sort of an instant uh, gratification there. And then you have your velocity. So now at the end of a sprint, I'm pushing this sort of back to Agile. You have a velocity of 10 stories, you have a velocity of 15 stories, and you see the end result of, state of, of collaborating. Not to say it's not true on the waterfall side at all, uh, because it is. I, I, I don't promote Agile versus waterfall, it depends on the situation. But I think I would write that book and I would tell people that working together uh, gives results. And it, you know, I'm fond of saying collaboration or teamwork, it's nice if we all like each other better. That's great. It's fantastic. But primarily for the project, if I go to my boss and he says, are you collaborating? I don't say, yeah, we all really like each other. He would say, I don't care if you like each other. Are you getting results? I'm, I'm happy you like each other. So. 
it's, it's about that and maybe about both some team building stuff. I'm going on about that, but that would be the title. It would be a lot about team building, uh, 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 collaboration, uh, sharing of things. I, I think it would be, it would be about that. And I've become a real proponent of that. So, um, like I said, even though I'm a sole practitioner, I still like to work with people and collaborate with people. You get the best results that way. I think there's even a principle around that. Again, going back to agile about the best architectures and things coming from self-organizing teams, which is a little bit higher than just collaboration. So that's my title. That's my book. And maybe I'll maybe I'll make a note to write that. <laughs> <laughs> that that's right. Yeah. I will be the first one to read it because I I would say collaboration and communication and and yeah. people liking each other. Um, right. You know, it's 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 sometimes easier said than done. Um, it is. It is. I'm mean, going to answer Joe's question. He asked where we can get my, my book. It's called How to Facilitate Productive Project Planning Meetings. It's up on Amazon. Jim Stewart and Rich Maltzman. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, yeah, it is easier said than done, but it's worth the challenge, isn't it? Everything is easier said than done. You know, we do the hard things. And to do the hard things, sometimes it's people are the hard thing we've got to work with. And so that's why we do coaching. That's why I do coaching, because when the person says, I can't do this, it's my job to try to figure out what is preventing you from, I'm mentoring somebody starting tomorrow. There's a woman who approached me and she is a scientist at Johns Hopkins. And she has asked me to um, coach her to a certain extent. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to do that and work with her and, you know, help with her collaboration and project management skills, et cetera. So you know, it will help her collaborate better. You know, a, and that's coaching, coaching and mentoring. That's wonderful. That's yeah. wonderful. I might be interested in taking you on that as well. There you go. Let's <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how it works out with her first, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it will be excellent. All right, so next question that I have uh, is, if receiving an award, how would your customers thank you for influencing their sustainability? Well, on this one, I'm gonna go back to my friend Rich again. It seems like he's here more than I am, right? Rich wrote a book on green project management sustainability. He and I were talking about this. He defines sustainability as not necessarily being green, although there's that. If you look at the Pinbach, he's influenced that book quite a bit at far. He talks about it as being influencing beyond the end of the project. So, and, and having people think beyond, an example he and I were talking about is, for example, if you were working with Keurig in the early days, or if somebody who was knowledgeable, sustainable, worked with Keurig, they might've said, you know those coffee pods you're putting out there? They're gonna become landfill. And so those stuff, now, what they do with that information is up to them. I mean, maybe some companies might say, that's not your job to worry about that. But I think as project managers, in addition to being strategic, it is our job to worry about not only the outcome of the project, but if we know anything that might affect society or the world or the market beyond the end of the project. So don't just think of sustainability as being don't you know they should print less because it's greener true but think about the after effects of the end of the project and what is that like if there's some social malfunction at the end of it if you will like i said it would be my job to a certain extent our job to think beyond the end of the project the houses what does this affect beyond the end? think of think of not just begin with the end in mind as covey used to say but think beyond the end in mind and so I don't know that they would give me an award. I would, maybe they would at least, if they gave me an award, it would only be because I helped them think about it. I can't think of a specific example where somebody would come back and say that I did do that. Maybe I did, and I can't think of it because I'm thinking in a different fashion. One of the problems we have as consultants is, and Rich and I were talking about this, they bring you in to do a specific thing and they like to keep you within a box. So I'm forever approached by, on LinkedIn mostly, by people who um, want me to go into companies and sell a tool that they have. And I say, you know, what? not sell, but recommend. I say, I like the tool that you have, but I'm going to almost guarantee you are going to go in and they're going to say, we didn't bring you in here to use that tool. And by the way, 
We already have Excel, which does everything. Excel is a project manager, it's a scheduler, it's a can opener, it does everything we want. Okay, we don't need any other tool. So after a while, I just stop unless they ask that. So the problem with this is they'll put me in a box and say, run this project, and that's all we want, stay within that scope. So my eyes are open to, to influence their sustainability, but I don't know that I've, I'm at the point yet where I would receive an award. So I'm still trying to, I know what to do, but I'm not at the place yet where somebody would say, well, you really affected. I, I guess the only thing I have done, I can say for sure, especially with the PMO, I've affected their way of thinking about how they run projects. There's a certain amount of sustainability there, but I'd like to do a little bit more than that. They would probably give me an award for thank if they wanted to at all. And most of our reward is consultants. They just pay us and maybe ask us to come back. If they gave me an award at all, it's because I helped them think outside the box a little bit. But I still needed more thinking for myself about how I can influence customers and what the effect of their product is in the market and making sure that, that they, even if they disregard my advice, at least they hear it. Absolutely, absolutely. And and I, I am all for sustainability. And within my realm, I'm trying to do the same. Uh, you know, think beyond, think after the project, think the project life after you're putting that last file away. Yeah. You know, what does that do um, to all this environment? And exactly. All, full landfills of plastics uh, that and bags that we're fishing out even from our oceans, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, there's just tons of plastic out there. It may not be anything that dire, but at least if you have the ability to, it's our, it's our professional obligation to tell the customer we can't make them do anything. We can't force a customer to do anything, but we can at least make them aware of a particular thing. I find though, truthfully, I'm usually so focused on bringing the project in on time. I'm maybe not thinking of the after game. So I have to make myself think about that more. It's a lesson for me, even seeing your question. We always have to train ourselves, yeah. right? To, to think in a certain direction, that's for sure. Yeah. All right, so I would like to um, kind of move on to the next topic, since we still have a couple of them and uh, we're starting to run out of time. So you are hosting an event to celebrate culture integration with a partner organization. What is the team? Simple, celebrate our cultures. So, you know, we would, if it's, liter if it's literally for that, the beauty part is it doesn't say you're hosting an event to get together and get to know each other. Celebrate culture integration. What about a chance? I live in uh, north of Boston, and we have every year, anybody who's around should come to it in July, we have the Lowell Folk Festival. And the Folk Festival is folk music from around the country, fiddlers, bluegrass, blues, you know, our old Americana music before there were electric instruments, although there are some of those as well. And when you go there, not only do they have that from all over, but they have a food court, the Ethiopian food, Korean food, you know, that whole thing. So I thought of that when I saw this, and I thought, well, if we're going to integrate with a partner organization as a culture, maybe I'm here in the States and they're in, say, Germany, and maybe there's somebody in Asia or whatever. Well, celebrate your culture. Tell us something about it. Show us something about it. Wear clothes that reflect that if you want, because one of the problems we have sometimes, I confess, especially here in America, we're so isolated sometimes. It seems like all we know is Canada and Mexico. So, uh, and barely even that, right? So it would be good to really open ourselves up to the other cultures because not only is it a fun thing to do to hear about other cultures, but also to make us work better together. Um, I have a book I read periodically. Called, it's called When Cultures Collide. It's by a guy named Richard Lewis, who's a Brit. Everybody should read it because he talks about, he's the kind of guy you go to if you say, I'm going to work in Saudi Arabia for six months. He's the kind of guy you go to to learn how to acclimate to that culture. I did work overseas, or at least with, with the Middle East last year, remotely. So not only will a culture event be fun for everybody and accepting of different cultures, but it'll make it, it'll pave the way for working across those cultures, I think. Even if the culture is from north to south, you know, from here, Massachusetts, down to Texas or whatever, or from here to England, or they, we know each other really well, or just the cultures of different states or cities, or even the culture of the company. Because different companies have different cultures, right? So 
that's what why don't we just be so exactly what you say here let's celebrate our cultures yes absolutely absolutely and uh I, I was fortunate um, working in, in companies that have a global presence. So um, I am dealing and learning a lot of things and favorite foods from every country is the That's most it. important thing. Absolutely, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> number one. My, right. uh, my yes. Finnish friend, the, one, the Finnish woman, uh, she and I were in Paris and she introduced me to pizza with an egg on top. So there's that. And then Finland sounds like an extraordinary exotic place to have to get to someday. They got all kinds of different cultural things there that are very interesting. So one day I'll get there. Yes, definitely. We must. <laughs> all right. Uh, so next one we have, what would be your signature song for what it takes to build a community? This makes me think of an old Maybe it was a 60s or 70s song called United We Stand. So United We Stand, Divided We Fall. Or like an R&B song. It would be that. I think it's that. If you're really building a community, we stand or we fall together. Um, of course, we want to stand. But we United We Stand, again, cliche. But what better way, if I'm saying that to myself, to feel like I'm really building a community and doing that. And we're all on it together. So that would be it's a nice song. It's a catchy song. Not my favorite song of all time, but it's not a bad song. You find yourself singing along with it, be here on the radio. Um, so, in a nutshell, that would that would, I might think of some other ones, but you know, when I first saw this, that's the first one that comes to mind. Uh, and and I think that's what it. I think that song is about, uh, you know, being in love or whatever. But it can be easily transferable to uh, to putting a community together. So I think that would be that would be the one I would. And I think a lot of people would like it too. It's sort of a middle of the road song. It's not heavy rock. It's not you know something too sappy. So it would be nice to do that. I think it would be nice. I like the idea of having a song to build a community. Although I will take that back a little bit and say, I can never get two people to agree on music. So, um, <laughs> okay, right. You never get, never get two people in the room to agree on, on what it can, uh, constitutes a good song, but it's a, it's a pretty good song for what it is. And, uh, and I think it speaks to the theme pretty well. All right. All right. So since we were talking about global cultures and foods, um, our next question uh, would be, if your company were a food, what would it be and why? Okay. Hopefully, I know Joe was interviewed. I didn't get tired of the end of your, your talk, Joe. So hopefully you haven't used this one. But this one comes right to mind, smorgasbord. It's not any partic one particular food. At a smorgasbord, there's a variety of foods. You can get meat, you can get pasta, you can get uh, what my son likes. He's not quite a vegetarian, but he likes a lot of health stuff. So my company is a food is a smorgasbord of food, and it is because um, I do a variety of things. I don't I do PMOs, but I don't just do PMOs. I run projects, but not just that. I write questions. I write courseware. Uh, I do agile. I do waterfall. I do hybrid. Uh, I consult uh, to people at a strategic level, uh, you know, just giving them advice. I mentor people, I coach people, uh, all those things. Uh, and the one thing I want to add that I haven't done yet, two things that, well, one thing I haven't done yet is an agile transformation. That would be the one thing I want to add to my, my skill set. I believe I could do one, but I haven't done one yet, so I can't pretend that I have. So for me, it would be a smorgasbord because of a, a variety of things I can do. And, uh, and you know, if somebody says, well, I came to your smorgasbord and I don't see this particular dish, and that dish is the agile transformation, I'll say, I'm sorry, we don't have that. We want to add it to the menu, but we're not quite there yet. <laughs> and if they were to say to me, well, could you add it on my behalf? And I say something like, well, if you're willing to give it a try, I haven't, I haven't cooked it before, but I'll cook it for you. Yeah, we'll give you a shot. So I see it like that a smorgasbord of offerings uh, within a specific set, and within that set, to bring it back to what I do is... Uh, within project management, mostly IT, some pharmaceutical, some financial, but I don't do construction, you know, um, for just for one example, or aeronautics. I've never been in those places, and it's likely I won't, wouldn't mind it, but I, I know enough to know that people in construction grow up in construction. So it's a, it's a specific set of foods that I offer. I'll probably be offering more over the course of the next year or so as I'm drawn into them. 
Uh, and I think it's a pretty satisfying smorgasbord of food. It isn't everything everybody wants, but I think it's sufficient for me to do a, a variety of things. I have a question here. Can I answer this? Somebody asked in terms of training. They asked uh, about, have I seen a rise in requests? Uh, can I answer this? Or do you want to ask another yes, question? Yes, yes, no, definitely, please. Okay, it says in terms of training, have you seen a rise in requests of the pa pandemic for how to implement or sustain an agile environment with distributed teams? Yeah, well, there's two things around that. The training has been, if you ask, let's stick with the training for a second. I've done some in-person training. I'm doing Agile ACP in person in Boston in December, which is the Agile Certified Practitioner. And so it's been like 80, 20 virtual because people don't want to still want to go places. Um, yeah, you know, somebody, the, the question was, how to implement a sustained agile environment with distributed teams. Here's the interesting thing. Not really, and I'm going to tell you why. The agilists already have been doing that. It's the agilists. I've been using Zoom since a year or more before the pandemic because of the agilists. I've been using Slack because of the agilists. I've been using Miro and somewhat Mural because of the agilists. If you go to any kind of an agile uh, session just for a webinar, they use a lot of those tools. So answer to Julie's question, Somewhat, yes, but it seems to me, and I could be maybe just my data point, I already seen that the Agilists fell into doing the distributed teams naturally because they were kind of doing them already. Agile teams tend to lean younger, a little more you know, experimental, and they were doing a lot of those things. So Julie, yeah, the answer is yes, but not as dramatically as you might think because it was sort of like they were already there. That's my observation. Yes. Yes, great, great, great insight. Thank you so much for answering that question. Uh, oh, I'm also writing a blog post. Uh, I can send it to you later. It's about doing retrospectives remotely. And if that's interesting, you can send it out to your, your group. I was asked to write it. So once it's available shortly, I can share it with you and you can share it with your folks if you'd like. Of course, of course. We're hungry for information. So anything that you can send to us, uh, and I'm sure our audience will be appreciative of that as well. Yeah. Thank you. So this kind of brought us to uh, the last of our uh, questions. And I'm not seeing too many questions popping up um, at this point. Okay. Um, just maybe real quick before our closure, could you um, give us in a, one or two sentences, what is your opinion that makes a PMO successful? Good question. I think it's leadership. It's sponsorship, number one, and it's leadership. And I think it has to have a clear mission, has to have a good, strong sponsor, and has to sustain itself in some way. It has to, it has to show value to the organization and then continue as value. It can't show, so it's got sponsorship, it's got leadership, it shows value. It can't show value today and then not show value in January because people will quickly lose interest. People will say, the PMO doesn't know what I want. So it has to move with the organization. We have business agility today. Organizations are moving fast. The PMO has to shift with it or it will not be of any value organization. I've seen them just go down, just succumb to that. So I would say sponsorship, leadership, and moving with the organization would be my three things. Great. Thank you so, so much. So, Jim, I would like to thank you uh, for your time today and uh, providing us really with great insights about you and about J.P. Stewart's Consulting. Uh, if people are interested in learning or tapping more into, um, I have uh, your contact in here uh, displayed for the audience. Um, is this all, it's your right phone and, and your right yeah. side? Everything is, everything is good there. If people want to send me questions, I don't start a clock or anything, right? So if they have questions, they can write to me. Is my email address there? Probably isn't for some reason. So, uh, isn't that funny? Of all things not to be there. So I'm at uh, jstewart at jpstewartconsulting.com. Okay, so we will correct that and yep. we'll let the, the audience know. Um, 
But anyways, thanks again. Uh, I right. think you brought us uh, a lot of good information today. And um, for all of the audience here, um, I would like to let you know that this concludes our spotlight on JP Stewart um, LLC today. Uh, I would like to encourage and be sure that you join us for our next episodes during November, where my co-host Julianne will be highlighting another great service organization. So please follow uh, as detail will be coming out soon on the PMO leader site uh, and in the social media as well. So I would like to thank you again, Jim. I would like to thank our host. Um, and um, I wish you a good day, uh, a good rest of the week. Uh, take care, stay safe, and see you next month. All right, take care. Thanks a lot. All right, Bye, thank you. Bye.